Welcome to the next episode of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Today we're going to dive into a deeper understanding of what's going on with gas in the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, these slides in this video are available under Creative Commons license. So let's talk about uh, Turing completeness and how it interacts with gas and the whole team problem. So as I talked about in some previous uh, lectures, in simple terms, a system or programming language is Turing complete if it can run any program. This capability, however, comes with an important caveat that some programs can take forever to run, you know, the infinite loop or whatever. Um, so an important aspect of this is that we won't know necessarily just by looking at a program whether or not it actually has an infinite loop bug in it. And so the program would take forever to execute or not. You actually have to go through and run the program and wait for it to finish to find out it's never gonna finish. Of course, if it's gonna take forever to execute, you have to wait forever to find out. And this is called the halting problem. It would be a big problem for Ethereum, the Ethereum virtual machine if we didn't have some way to deal with this problem. And our, you know, because of the halting problem, the Ethereum world computer is at risk of being asked to execute a program that never stops. However, with gas, there is a, a solution. If after a certain amount of computation has been performed, the execution hasn't ended, the execution of the program could be halted by the EVM. You know, and we have to deal with this because there could be an infinite loop due to an accident, or it could actually be sort of a denial of service attack. And, you know, and so if, if the EVM were stuck in an infinite loop, um, the EVM itself could become un unusable because it's a single threaded machine. So that's why we use gas, because then we know if after the amount of computation that's specified by the gas has been performed and the program hasn't halted yet, then we're just gonna go ahead and halt the program. And so we never have to worry about a program executing for too long. It'll only execute up to it hits the gas limit. Now the gas limit isn't actually fixed in Ethereum. You, and um, and you can agree to increase that maximum, um, but there is a limit in transactions that can consume too much gas while executing are halted. So gas makes the Ethereum virtual machine essentially a quasi Turing complete machine. You can run any program you feed into it, but only if the program terminates within the particular amount of computation that is paid for by the gas you provided. And this is, you know, significantly in contrast to Bitcoin, where transaction fees aren't about the amount of execution being performed. Instead, in Bitcoin, transaction fees only take into account the size of a transaction in kilobytes. You know, um, they're looking, the Bitcoin transaction fees are looking at the size of the transaction that's being stored in the memory and sent across the network. They're not looking at how much execution uh, required requirements are going to be placed on the network. And that's because, and instead with Ethereum, however, we have, we account for every computational step performed by the transactions and the smart contract code. So for example, uh, operations performed by a transaction or a contract, you know, generally cost a fixed amount of gas. You know, some examples from the Ethereum yellow paper, adding two numbers costs three gas, sending a transaction costs 21,000 gas, um, calculating the hash, um, you know, costs like 30 gas and six gas for each additional 256 bits of data being hashed and so on. Um, gas is a crucial component of Ethereum and serves it multiple roles. It's a buffer between the volatile price of Ethereum and the reward to miners for the work they do, and is a defense against denial of service attacks. It also prevents accidental or malicious infinite loops or other computational wastage in the, in the network. And the initiator, who, you know, the person who creates a transaction, is required to set a limit into the amount of computation they're willing to pay for. Um, the gas system thereby dis 
provides a disincentive against attackers from spending spam transactions, since if they would want to spam the network, they'd have to pay for all that spam, proportionally to the computation, bandwidth, and storage resources that their computations require. Now, recently, the London upgrade, um, which is EIP 1559, introduced variable size blocks to Ethereum and changed how gas fees work. Uh, each block now has a target size of 15 million gas, but the size of blocks will increase or decrease in accordance with network, network demand up to the block limit of 30 million gas, which is du double the target block size. The protocol achieves an equilibrium in, uh, block size of 15 million on average through a process referred to as tetonement, where basically as the uh, block size gets larger, you know, we start charging more until the price, until it go, goes down. So if the block size is greater than the target block size, the protocol will increase the base fee for the following block. Similarly, the protocol will decrease the base fee if the block size is less than the target block size. And so the amount by which the base fee is adjusted is proportional to how far the current block size is from the target. Um, the EIP was author authored to address various inefficiencies around the legacy uh, first price auction fee system, um, namely um, because of the role of miners and um, and other issues, there were, you know, fee overpayments, fee volatility, and transaction delays. And so to deal with these efficiencies, EIP 1559's authors proposed implementing this fixed per block fee system with dynamic block sizes. And they also included a fee burning mechanism, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so EIP 1559 was discussed, researched, and tested for several years until it was finally included in the London upgrade last year in 2021. So basically now what we have is we've got a base fee for a block. And this base fee is actually set by the protocol and it indicates the minimum amount of gas that must be used for a transaction to be included in an Ethereum block. If a transactor sets their fee cap to higher than the base fee and adds a tip for miners and the validators, uh, once validators replace miners, uh, the trans person who's submitting the transaction can reasonably assume their transaction will be confirmed in the following series of blocks. This dynamic is in contrast to the legacy fee system in which a user could fire off a transaction and conditions could change so that the transaction wouldn't confirm for hours. Uh, another change is that base fees do not go to the miner anymore. Instead, they're simply destroyed, um, which is referred to as burnt in Ethereum speak. Uh, and if demand for Ethereum block space, block space permits, this could potentially lead to ETH being a deflationary asset, in addition to you know, other reasons why ETH might be deflationary. So you can also set a tip. Um, so the base fee is set by the protocol, and then the user can include a tip as a for a compensation to compensate the miner and the validator. Uh, the tip also allows uh, someone to submit a transaction, the ability to pay a premium over the base fee to ensure that their transaction is mined earlier. You know, so, you know, you know, by providing a tip, you ensure that the miner wants to include your transaction in their block. Um, and when Ethereum blocks are at the 100% full point uh, and the base fee is at the maximum, the tip also essentially is the equivalent of the legacy first price auction system in which miners are gonna look for the highest tips to put in the block before they look at the lower transactions with lower tips. So there's also a fee cap. So this is you know set by your user's wallet. The fee cap will indicate the maximum amount of gas that the creator of the transaction is willing to pay for a transaction. The fee cap includes the base fee and the tip. And when a transaction gets confirmed, the transactor receives a refund as the difference between what's actually spent and the proposed fee cap. So the fee cap minus the base fee and the tip equals the refund that comes back. And so this system ensures a user never pays more gas than they're willing to in order to get a transaction included in an Ethereum block. So just to recap what gets burned versus paid out, under EIP 1559, the miners and then later the validators get paid block rewards and tips. 
and the base fees that are paid for the transaction actually get burned. Users set their own fee caps and tips, uh, but the base fee is determined by the protocol based on the demand for the, the, block, the blocks. Uh, EIP 1559 still sort of has some approach where um, um, you, users can ensure that a transaction is more high priority than other transactions by, you know, uh, including you know, tips at higher levels to encourage uh, miners or validators to include your transaction in the tip and to in the block. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about what is actually going on with the EVM during execution. The EVM is actually doing accounting of what's being spent in terms of gas. So when the EVM is needed to complete a transaction, you know, it's given a gas supply in equal to the amount specified in the transaction. Uh, every operation code that is executed has a cost in gas, as we talked about before. And so the EVM's gas supply is reduced as the EVM steps through the program. Uh, you know, and, and executes each step in that program. Before each operation, EVM checks if there's enough gas to pay for that operation's execution. If there isn't enough gas, execution is halted and the transaction is reverted. If the EVM reaches the end of execution successfully without running out of gas, the total gas, gas paid you know, is paid as a transaction fee, either to the base fee um, you know, that we talked about earlier, or it's going out in, you know, to the tip and so forth. Um, the gas remaining, the gas supply is going to be refunded to the sender, converted to ether based on the gas price specified in the transaction. And if the transaction runs out of gas during execution, the transaction is reverted and all changes of the state are rolled back, but the miner still gets to keep the tip. Um, you can see uh, a detailed list of table of gas costs at this link I have here. Um, generally speaking, the more computationally intensive operations are going to cost more go gas. So, for example, executing the SHA-3 function is 10 times more expensive than the, the add operation, which makes sense because you know, the SHA-3 is a hashing operation that requires a lot more computations than simply adding two numbers. Um, there's also a gas cost to using storage. And actually, um, when you're storing data, that gets very expensive. And that's one of the most expensive things you can do on the blockchain is to store data. Um, the, there have been attacks against gas costs. Um, you know, the importance of matching gas costs to real world cost resources was demonstrated uh, throughout multiple attacks over the life of Ethereum, um, including, you know, very early on in 2016, when there were attackers who attempt to uh, try and grind Ethereum to a halt by generating transactions that were computationally expensive. Um, and, you know, but eventually those vulnerabilities were fixed. Um, and that particular attack was fixed by a hard fork uh, in 2016 called the Tangerine Whistle hard fork. Um, you know, gas is, you know, gas price is essentially the amount of ether you're willing to pay per unit gas. Uh, while gas has a price, you don't actually own or spend it, spend gas. It, you really own and spend Ethereum. And it's just gas is a comp some computations that are being performed by the Ethereum platform in the EVM to determine exactly how much ETH you're gonna spend. Ethereum also encourages the deletion of used storage variables and accounts to reduce the amount of memory that's being used in the Ethereum protocol. Um, and so how it does that is the Ethereum platform will refund some gas uh, if you use some of these operations that can refund gas. So for example, deleting a contract is worth a refund of 24,000 gas because you're removing that contract from the memory. Changing a storage address from a non-zero value to zero is also worth the refund because it's a lot easier to store zeros. Um, so just to kind of reiterate, the block gas limit is the max amount of gas that can be consumed by all transactions in a block and constrains how many transactions can fit into a block. And this is a little bit different from how uh, Bitcoin stores transactions in a block. Bitcoin is really looking at the size of the block in terms of memory and so forth. Uh, whereas for Ethereum, we're looking at how much gas that block is going to use in its transactions. 
If a miner tries to include a transaction that requires more gas than the current block gas limit, the blocks can be rejected by the network. And so this actually gives you another thing to think about. If you're doing something complicated in a transaction that's going to require a lot of gas, then you might end up in a block with not many other transactions. So it's something else to think about in terms of how you're going to get your transactions picked up by the network. So uh, the London upgrade, as I mentioned earlier, introduced these variable size blocks. Each block has a target size of 15 million gas, but it can up, increase up to or 30 million gas, which is the double the target block size. And, the, and as I mentioned earlier, we, we reached this equilibrium block size of 15 million by increasing the base fee if this, the current block size is higher and decreasing the base fee if the current block size is lower than the 15 million target. So in summary, the Ethereum virtual machine running on the Ethereum blockchain can be thought of as a global decentralized computer containing millions of executable objects, each with its own permanent data store. Uh, the EVM instruction set offers a range of functionality for programming smart contract scripts for the EVM in higher level languages. Uh, the Ethereum state is a transactional situation. Uh, EVM transitions from one state to the another as a result of smart contract code execution. And generally speaking, you know, you're going to program these smart contracts in a higher level language such as Solidity or Viper, and then the uh, compiler will translate the high level code to bytecode that is then executed by the EVM. And as we mentioned, EVM is almost Turing complete, uh, except for the fact that uh, we've solved the, the halting problem uh, by using gas to constrain the amount of execution. Um, and every smart contract is invoked with a gas limit and the smart contract aborts if the gas depletes before valid termination. So thanks for tuning in uh, to this short little presentation on gas and tune in next time when we'll dive deeper into uh, another topic on the Understanding Crypto series.